Welcome to the City of Forest Grove Libraries Off the Shelf Podcast. Um, this is our latest episode. I think this is the seventh one for the Off the Shelf channel, which is the Librarian's channel. We also have the Fine Print, which is the Teen Library Council channel, so look for that as well. We're found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and through the Podbean, Podbean app. Um, today we're excited to have Tim Applegate with us, poet and novelist, and lives in the area. Is it Gaston? Are you in Gaston? Or I actually live in the Laurelwood area, which is just a oh, few miles yeah, from yeah. Gaston. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh-huh. yeah. And Tim is the author of the novels Fever Tree and Flamingo Lane and a couple of collections of poetry. And the two novels are actually part of a trilogy, I understand, of which the third one may be in the works. I'm almost finished with it. All right, all right. Um, Tim, you've been in this area for a couple of decades, but these novels are novels of Southern noir. Tell us about that, (laughs) if you would. I seem to only be able to write about places after I leave them. Uh, That I I spent, uh, before we moved to Oregon, I spent, uh, my family and I spent uh, 13 years in Florida. Okay. And I was especially fond of the panhandle of Florida, uh, in particular, the town of Apalachicola. And when I started to sort of sketch out notes for Fever Tree, I realized that I really wanted to set the book in the South. And there was a number of reasons for that, one of them being the influence of Flannery O'Connor on my work. And I thought there was no better town to set it in than Apalachicola. Mm -hmm. But I didn't feel completely comfortable writing about Apalachicola, even though I'd been there numerous times, but I wasn't there at the time I was writing the book. So I decided to, to write to uh, create a fictional town based on Apalachicola. Crooked River. Crooked, Crooked River, River right. which yeah, is, okay. the waterfront is based on Apalachicola. The town square itself is completely fictional. There is no town square in Apalachicola. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay. So anyway, I decided to uh, set it there and set the second one partially there also. And my publisher took it and ran with it and uh, decided to call it on the cover a novel of Southern Noir. Okay. So which is fine for me. Yeah. I mean, yes. yeah. So that kind of dictated the rest of the <laughs> series, perhaps? Uh, kind of? Somewhat, though. Mm-hmm. I, I They're not technically a series, obviously. They're, yeah, they're standalone I, novels. That's exactly. About that. exactly. Sure. And I do... Uh, get asked that often uh, whether what I mean by a standalone novel that's also sort of a part of a series Mm -hmm. and um, the carryover in the books are certain characters the time frame is not it doesn't start the day after the first book ends the second book doesn't start then it starts two years later and they're completely different stories Mm -hmm. there is some carryover of characters and that's what connects them. Well, certainly Dieter from Fever Tree and Flamingo Lane. Though I will say that Dieter's not in the third book. (laughs) That's one of my questions. But I want to get back to something you said before. As a writer, do you think it's... um, Easier is the wrong word, but is it more approachable to write about a place and a sense of place once you have left it and once you're you're there... um, because I think about this, because I write a lot of songs. I'm a songwriter, sure. and I have the same sort of experience. Like I've written okay. songs related to things that happened and where I lived. I just finished a song about living in Vermont. Okay, kind of most nostalgic sort of thing, and I haven't lived there since 19, 2000, 2000 I guess it was twenty okay. plus years. So sure. I wonder if that affects your writing as well. I mean, when you're grounded in a place, you're almost too close. I uh, yes, I didn't. Um consciously think about this until I started uh, writing poems after I moved to Oregon and I found myself writing a lot of poems that were set in both Florida and in Indiana where I grew up Mm -hmm. and it took me years to start writing poems decent poems about Oregon Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's a matter of perspective but it's probably very similar to what you are talking about with your songs I, I just find it easier and in fact um I will probably write a book set mainly in Oregon after I leave Oregon. Yeah, yeah. And I have one. <clears throat> I have one outlined. Oh, okay. So uh, I, I don't quite understand it, uh-huh. but I'm not complaining because <clears throat> it helps me. It it also is a sort of way to revisit those places exactly. that I have a, a, <clears throat> um, very fond memories of. So um, 
So that it, it fulfills that, too. That's, that's totally something I can identify with, for I bet. sure. I mean, the last song I wrote was so sepia-toned, in a sense. I don't, I don't really write nostalgic songs, but right. the lyrics are very nostalgic, and actually the melody is kind of as well. And sure. And it's like, I didn't know I was writing this until I started writing it, right? Interesting. So, sure. But you create, uh, getting back to your work, you create a wonderful sense of place. I mean, that struck me in Fever Tree, and that's why I wanted to ask you questions about where you've been and where you've lived. The sense of okay. crooked, crooked River. I mean, that opening scene as Dieter is driving into the South and into Florida. It, did that, when you start a novel, how do I frame the question? How long did it take you to write that intro? I mean, you have to decide how, I've, how, I mean, you had a great quote at the beginning of Fever Tree, right? From, let me find it here very quickly. So there there are always, there are always two plots. A man rides into town or a man leaves from Penelope Scrambly Shot. And, right, a man's riding into town and he's bringing a lot of baggage with him too yes. that we keep experiencing right. throughout the book. So is that, was that easy for you to decide how I'm going to start this book? I mean, this is, this is your first novel as well. I mean, uh, well it's my first, my published, first novel. published novel. is the third one I'd mm -hmm. written. Um, <clears throat> but that's a great question. I, um, the first chapter of, the, of Fever Tree took me longer to write than any chapter in hmm. either of the two books. And I did have a sort of an idea where the story was going, of course, and I had the, the main characters sketched out. I had them filed on what they look like physically and their, their hobbies, that kind of thing, like writers do. But I also sort of let the book, so since it starts with a journey, take me on the journey also. Right. Which is what, as a poet, I do, and a lot of poets do. You know, you, know, you have a beginning line, and then all of a sudden it goes somewhere else, and you just try to hang on, right? Right. Uh, but that, that first um, scene was, the first chapter was you know, obviously the key to the book. And I, I changed it a lot. I must have revised that chapter 25 times mm -hmm. um, because I met, wanted to make sure I wasn't giving too much away. I was holding back enough, but giving the reader enough to keep them turning the pages. Right. So it, it was difficult, and it got easier. Well, not easier, but it... it, it um, there were less revisions of chapter two and three and four and onward because I was, I was in one place mm -hmm. and I, I knew it exactly what it looks like in my mind. And, um, so that made the transition from the first chapter quite yeah, easier. Once you got that down, your roadmap was kind of starting to sh take shape. Yes. There was a quote from William Zinser in one of his books on, uh, on writing okay. years ago. I talked about, you may not, I'm, I'm very loosely paraphrasing, but it struck me the idea that driving, writing a story, writing a, a novel is kind of like driving in a dark night with your headlights on. You don't, you can't see the destination, but you see what appears in front of you, and that keeps taking you down that path, sort of. And Interesting. A very, there's a, it's a better quote than I'm remembering. Right. But that's the gist of it. Right. So well, you know, some some writers have very very strict outlines. They're sort of the um, <clears throat> literary version of how Alfred Hitchcock made his movies, where everything was storyboarded. Storyboarded, right? I, I'm not. I'm one of the other ones mm -hmm. that um, have the basic outline pretty much know how it's going and where it's going but there's a lot of room for maneuver in there yeah but that's a that's a good image because it is the only thing i'm not sure of is if it's like driving with your headlights on or off <laughs> <laughs> some days they're they're, they're they shine yeah. brightly some yeah. days they don't yeah <laughs> so you're a native of indiana uh, right. i was actually born in georgia born in georgia so there's, another, there's another okay. southern connection, but I was there for a short time. My mm -hmm. father was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. We lived in Georgia, lived in uh, Great Falls, Montana when I was mm. small. My father was uh, based in, at Malmstrom Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And then we moved, I was in the second grade at the time, um, to Terre Haute, Indiana, which is where my parents were from and where I still had a little... Um, uncles and aunts and other family there. So I was in Indiana until I went to college at Indiana University and moved to Bloomington and then from, from there eventually to Florida and from Florida Boston. eventually. You were in Boston too. And I was in Boston for, I had, um, 
I had a period of four years after I graduated from high school where, well, <laughs> I don't want to have to take the fifth or anything, but <laughs> it was it was my kind of my wild, <laughs> carefree I, days. I see. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I traveled around. I hitchhiked. I didn't make money. Um, I took jobs uh, in labor pools and this and that. And at one point, I did end up in Boston, and, and, and winter was coming on, and I thought I better I better make some money and find a warm room, mm -hmm. dry room. Right. So I ended up staying there for uh, not quite a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was in a motorcycle accident. I had to go, and I hobbled home. Oh, <laughs> so in Fever Tree, there is a big Mexico connection as well. You yes. haven't mentioned Mexico in your travels, and you, you seem to have a fingertip feel for that part of the, is the Yucatan Peninsula. It is the Yucatan area. Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in Mexico, and uh, a favorite place of mine and my wife's is uh, uh, Isla Mujeres, which is an island that you may be familiar with. It's off of the coast of the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a ferry out from Cancun, and the last time I was there, I thought there's, I, I, I just felt like I wanted to put that in, in a fictional setting, mm -hmm. that experiences we had the the experiences that we had there so i also wanted to kind of have a hook for all of these characters well not all of them but for a number of the characters that this is where they knew each other from and it's expanded a little bit in the second book that um they or some of the characters initially met there mm -hmm. and formed yeah. relationships and uh in the third book that is really the only connection um, to the other two books is, is the a character named Parrish, who's a Vietnam veteran, mm -hmm. and who was in Mexico and was mentioned briefly in both the first two books, uh, is the main character in the third book, which is actually set in New Orleans. And um, he flashes back on scenes and things that happened in Mexico, too. So it's it's a, just it's a connection for them. Plus, to be honest with you, I wanted to write about Mexico. Um, it's a it's a country I have um, really deep feelings for. I uh, spent time in different parts of it, and it's a country I I like a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think for a, a lot of Americans who haven't spent time there, it's a misunderstood country. Mm -hmm. So. You uh, gave me some background about your influences mm -hmm. and your styles. And so, oh, yes. And uh, tell me about the character of Dieter, who appears, obviously, he's one of the main characters in right. both the first two books. And as a reader, to me, he seems like the fulcrum of the Fever Tree, but maybe not to you, based on what you shared with me. Um, you stated you're drawn to the unsavory characters that you place in your fiction, such as Colt in yes. Fever Tree. And I... And I and I hate to think you identify with chance, but maybe you do. And <laughs> mingle in. So no, I'm, I'm I'm with no. T tell me more about that because Dieter, uh, Dieter is like an imposing character. Obviously, he seems like, as I said, the fulcrum of the first yes. book. But he may not be the character you sympathize or empathize with the most. Um, that's another good question. I and I've not been asked it that way before. A uh, friend of mine in a bar told me a young woman that. She after she read the book, she just came up to me and she said, "You're Dieter," and mm -hmm. I said, "No, I'm yeah. not. It's fictional, right?" right. She right. said, "So she says to me, uh, when did you live in Bloomington?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, seventy three, seventy four till seventy eight. Yeah, she says, "Just like Dieter." And then where'd yeah. you go? I said, "Well, I went to Florida." <laughs> <laughs> but I said that, that was not. Uh, that that is not being obviously it isn't though there are some similarities mm -hmm. and like any other writer I borrow things from real people mm -hmm. uh, it can be physical it can be emotional uh, it can be where they live um, and I did borrow f from Dieter when I said though that I was more attracted to the unsavory characters um, and maybe I, that's not the word you use. But no, that's, uh, a, that's a perfectly uh, good yeah. word for mm -hmm. it. And Colt Taylor is, to me, the most important character in the first book. Mm -hmm. I thought if I was able to um, elicit the sympathy, some sympathy from readers for Colt, that I had done my job. And what I mean by that is that I grew up in a really rough and tumble town. Um, blue collar, lots of drugs bad drugs, um, alcoholism, 
crime. And I knew a lot of, uh, to use your word, uh, unsavory characters, Mm -hmm. including, I have to be careful here, including a couple of members. No names. (laughs) Including a couple of people in my family. I'll just say it that way. Um, And I was very intent on writing about people who had their heart in the right place and just kept making one bad decision after another because I saw it a lot. And I could have been one of them very, very easily. I almost was. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a natural sympathy. I mean, these are not serial killers. These are not horrible people. These are people that make bad decisions from Mm -hmm. time to time. And And they hurt people. Uh, I'm talking emotionally now, and uh, it, it for me it was the most interesting. Colt was the most interesting character that I was writing. Mm-hmm. And again, getting back to Colt, well, he did correct me if I'm wrong. Enlist Raúl yes. in the book to take care of the main character, Dieter. Yes. <laughs> at some point. Yes. And at some point, you know, he's an interesting character, but that sense of, you know, connection is slipping away until it's, it's almost recaptured. I won't reveal the ending. It's kind of recaptured in the ending, and you realize just all the things he was trying to cope with and work through. And right. Well, I, I really um, brooded over how to make him sympathetic. And one of the things that hopefully does... Uh, it, and it's based on a true person, is he has a deep love for his son. Mm. He's a very mm-hmm. good father. And I thought, oh, is that kind of cheap sentimentality? And I thought, no, because the person I based the character on was exact, is exactly that way mm-hmm. with his kids. Mm-hmm. So and, that was the hook. And that's, that's a saving grace, but... But he's still, yeah, uh, let's I face mean, it, he's still an awful person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Gold. I mean, I'm thinking of the minor characters, how you introduce minor characters, and he occurs again in the he second does. novel. I mean, he's, he fascinates me. The hotel proprietor at the Gibson, is that? Was it it Gibson? is the Gibson. The yes. Gibson. Uh, there's a scene where Dieter manages to show you know, poise and genuine affection while at the same time kind of managing his communication because Mr. Gold wants to know everything about yes. his guests. Right? He's, always, he's making assumptions about who they are based on their clothes. Right. Uh, and then we see uh, almost there's like a doppelganger of a scene in Flamingo Lane where Chance meets Mr. Gold and yes. it doesn't feel quite the same way because Chance is not the same person as Dieter but Dieter is very uh, reserved and yes. doesn't reveal stuff unless he absolutely has to right. and, but Chance's character in Flamingo Lane is basically using people for the most part but he's also a very very troubled individual with mm-hmm. drug addiction problems absolutely uh, Really, his path is pretty hopeless at that point because he's mm-hmm. got a task he, he's going to follow through on, we think, and we can't identify with it greatly, but we also know that if he doesn't succeed, that his life is probably forfeit at that point as well. It's right. a good chance. So do you see Colt in Chance and the name Chance? Where did that come from? Is that a coincidence? or? Um, well, there obviously is a famous Chance in literature, which is in Kaczynski's being there. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I just uh, it just popped into my head one mm-hmm. day, and I thought I like that. I like uh, that we don't even reveal what his first name is until nearly the end of the book. Right. He's just Chance, mm-hmm. um, and there was, of course, the um, catch where he does things sometimes spontaneously, doesn't mm-hmm. think things out, and he kind of lives a life of chance. Mm-hmm. So for sure, yeah. yeah. But Mr. Gold, I I, uh, I did enjoy writing that yeah. character too. The first idea I actually had for Mr. Gold was the was the movie you may be familiar with called The Grifters. It's a oh, Stephen you get that from, movie. from early nineties. Yeah, and John Cusack, John and Cusack, and Angel- what's her name? Angelica Houston and someone else. Another, she was a young actress oh, at the yes. time who uh, appeared I, in a number of things in the nineties. She's 90s married and, to Warren Beatty. If you say so, I don't remember yeah, that part, just, but. Anyway, yeah. Good actors. The grifters, yep, 92. But anyway, the, the visual, you know, when you're writing, you, you you see these people in your mind, and then you go through that whole thing. How much do I just, desc- how well do I just, desc- how thoroughly do I describe them? Am I doing too much, this and that? But that was the, it wasn't so much the characters, the look. I, and I don't, I forget the that character actor's name, but he had that sort of manner where, um, 
everything sort of bemuses him mm-hmm. like it does Mr. Gold. And he pretends not to be asking all of these questions, but obviously Mr. Gold is the town, the town's ultimate gossip. Mm-hmm. He knows, he wants to know everything. Yep. And he's very yeah. clever at it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. He's had a lot of years experience developing the skill, for right. sure, right? But I also so, wanted to have, I, I, I enjoy novels that have humor in them. Mm-hmm. And I, as a poet, too, I, I, rarely, I don't see a lot of humor in poetry. And I don't mean like Ogden Nash type of humor. I mean, right. Um, I, I suppose for listeners to the podcast, a lot will be familiar with Bill with uh, Billy Collins. Oh, sure. Yeah. And Collins does, uh, some of his poems have nice uh, ingredients of humor in them. There's a there's a great Oregon poet named Clem Stark. I don't know if you know Clem. Don't know him. Um, he won the uh, Oregon Book Award with his first book, but he's a fantastic poet. And his he has a very sly sense of humor, both as a person and it comes through in his poems. Mm-hmm. So when... Uh, and I try to put it in, do that in some of my poetry without pushing it too hard. But I was also kind of determined that both the first two books would have lighter moments. And hopefully, for readers, Mr. Gold mm. provides some of those. He does. It helps. Yeah. I recently read an Irish, no, I'm sorry, a Scottish noir novel, and it is really good. It's called Bloody January by mm. a guy named Adam Parks. It was the first of a series. But my goodness, after a while, it's just, you know, you just want some comic relief. And he provides some. Some mm-hmm. of the characters mm-hmm. are quirky enough that, it, I mean, it's a very dark sort of Coen Brothers humor. I see. But at least yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like, okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I recently read, well, no, I guess it was last year now. Uh, what's his name? Oh, God. It's awful. Irish writer. Snow, which is, he also writes, uh, oh, my God, John... You're not helping me here, Tim. Well, give me a clue. <laughs> I know. I, oh, I'll let that one go. But it, it's kind of a procedural because it deals with a detective in Ireland. Yeah. He's like, and you get a backstory of the Irish Protestant Catholic conflict and prejudice because he's, I can't remember if he's Catholic or Protestant working class guy trying sure, to solve sure. crime in a big crumbling old mansion with right. an old Irish family and the tensions that exist there as he tries to solve the crime. John Bean uh, something. He's written some really brilliant serious novels and this okay. is this is serious but it's more procedural. John and Banville. Have, thank you very there much you Tim. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Just ask the writer. <laughs> yeah. Because he does write a series of books that are in a series about yes. some crime, procedural crime thing with a character. And he has, I think he uses a pen name for those. Does he? He know? does. He does. Uh, I don't remember uh, the pen name. I read the first yeah. one. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great writer. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a question there. I'm just creating an observation. Well, you were, it. and you were talking about the humor. Perhaps yeah. it's a yeah. little. Yeah. And there's a little, it's very, it's dry. There's little particles of it in yeah. the book, but. Well, even in Banville's yeah. dark, serious, yeah. well, serious is the wrong word, but his, his, his non-crime novels, yeah. some of those just awful people that narrates, that he has doing the first-person narration, sometimes they're just so awful you laugh. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah. oh, my gosh, I can't believe he said he say these kinds of things. So, yeah. But again, it's well, welcome humor, right? Yeah. It, yeah, it was like Elizabeth Taylor reading her four stories again. Yes. And it's like the, this dry, funny, biting uh, comedy. It's, oh, my God, that's hysterical. And she's intending it to be funny, but it's within the narrative thread of this story that it almost blows right by you before you realize just how funny that was. Well, you <laughs> and I skewering have... somebody. Exactly. You and I have a connection with Patrick Hamilton. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you find Absolutely. his, his um, books, even though they're pretty dark... They're, they're mostly pretty dark, but... But they the, do have... There's there's humor because it's, he has the whole range of humanity embodied in a lot of his characters. I think he's brilliant. Right. I do. I think he's brilliant. Or he Me was too. when he was in his prime, and I haven't read the stuff in the 50s when he was on the downhill slope, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we actually added a copy of the, the 20,000 Streets Under the Sky in the yes. art collection here now, as well as uh, the Slaves of Solitude, which oh, yes, I read as well, both, and yeah. of course, Hangover Square. Right. Which are all dark. Well, they are dark. It. They're dark, but they're they're just they're, they just embody everything in humanity in the characters. I think. Well, my theory is um, there is humor in most people's lives, mm-hmm. even if they have 
difficult, difficult lives. There are flashes of humor. I mean, it is part of life. It's it's a mechanism we sometimes use to just deal with all the mm -hmm. awful stuff. To deflect things. To deflect sure. things. Mm -hmm. And and I, I for me, Hamilton's uh, books are so real, so lifelike that they would be remiss not to have a little bit of that. Of course, in it, right? of course, absolutely. Yeah, it's right. just natural. Yeah, yeah. 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 Getting back to your writing, um, you shared with me, as I said before, a wide range of influences on your writing, yes. and, and you didn't mention somebody who I thought of, and maybe you no. haven't really read, Larry Brown, who's a, oh, yes. yeah, who died young of a heart attack he in his did. early 50s, but he wrote some really marvelous novels, including Faye, I believe, was one of them, one of yes. the characters is, is named Faye, and, but yeah, I just found it marvelous. There was a period of time where I was reading through all of his stuff. I um, was disappointed to see his career end so tragically young. Yes, he, he was a great writer. Mm -hmm. um, I just read the one, is it called Father? or? Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's one called Father, and he wrote Joe as well. And, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he was a remarkable writer. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing to me about literary influences for any writer, mm -hmm. and I've talked to numerous writers about this, whether they're novelists or poets or whether they write memoirs or whatever, that a lot of times um, somebody will bring up, for instance, at a reading or after a reading, they'll be talking to me or other writers, I've, I've done it, and say, I, I kind of thought there was an influence of so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And Again, my theory is that a lot, if not most of the influences, at least in my writing, I don't even know about. They're right. subconscious. I mean, I had a, a good friend who uh, called me after he read Fever Tree and said, oh, I got a really kick out of you calling the gardener Uncle Billy and, you know, because we made, we used to call so-and-so Uncle Billy, which was not in my mind. I completely <laughs> forgot it, but obviously it was, it was somewhere. Still there. So <laughs> for all I know, Larry Brown influenced me. Well. And I, I felt him in the way. You take that as a compliment. I do take that as a compliment. He's a marvelous, marvelous writer. So. Oh, if I'm in a sentence with people like Larry yeah. Brown, I'm, <clears throat> I'm complimented. Yeah. So getting back to Dieter. Yes. Okay. And the fact that Dieter's not you. <laughs> sort <laughs> are, of. Are you a compulsive <laughs> note taker when you observe your world? Are you one of those guys, one of those people that sits in a bar or sits in a restaurant by yourself with a notepad or your iPad or whatever? Actually. You uh, are, of course I, you uh, are. You and, I, and I'm and i old school, so yeah. I actually do it with a notepad. Right. Uh, I keep a, and I've always done this because um, I sometimes an idea for a poem will pop into my head. Sometimes a line from a poem will be in a dream. And so I keep a notebook right by my bed by, on my night, night table with the pen next to it. And sometimes I wake up at 2, 3, 8 o'clock in the morning and start jotting down these yeah. notes I had mm -hmm. from a dream. and Because you know you won't remember them. Because the I know I won't it's, remember them. You don't them. really want to wake up at right. 3 o'clock, but you have no choice. <clears throat> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But people observation is, I mean, it's something I, like most people, I like to do. Mm -hmm. And there are some great places to watch people. Mm -hmm. I'm... One of the uh, interesting things about setting a novel in New Orleans, like my third book, is is it's one of the ultimate people watching places. There's just such a wide variety of folks in that town, physically, mentally, mm -hmm. um, their, their personal histories, their humor. That um, I spent two weeks when I decided to write in, about New Orleans, and I had spent there a lot of time there when I was um, living in Florida. But I spent two weeks when I decided to write there, and I just did what you were talking about for two mm -hmm. solid weeks. I took, well, thank God for digital cameras, right? I took so many photos. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd, I'd say, well, maybe I think to myself, maybe this will be a spot for a, a scene, and then I just took notebooks full of notes about people that I saw, and referred back to them constantly when I was writing the book. New Orleans it feels to me like a place in America that's quintessentially unique, unlike any other small city. I don't, I haven't been to every small city, I, mm -hmm. but I've been to New Orleans three times, and I there can't compare it to any other place in the United States. It almost doesn't feel like you're in the United States, except for the language, right? Because it's the cultural diversity, right? Um, well, racial tension as well. Um, just the sense of flamboyance, color, and 
decadence and all these things in history blending together. Yes. Um, it's just, I don't even know how to describe it very well, and I don't think I've experienced it deeply enough to know. It sounds like you probably dug a bit deeper than I have. Well, that's exactly what I say about um, both New Orleans and um, the Bayou Country south of mm -hmm. New Orleans and, and out west. When I first started going there in the um, early 80s, it really was exactly like a foreign country. There was much more uh, authentic Cajun uh, places, uh, language. You, it's it's a it's a little bit uh, different now, but though there's still obviously lots of Cajuns there, but uh, it it could have been a, it could've, you could have been in France or parts of Canada. Um, and I loved that. Mm -hmm. And and New Orleans is the most unique. I mean, I have, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or anything, but I, from a former job, I traveled a lot, um, domestically and overseas, and I've just never experienced a town like New Orleans anywhere. It is just so unique, and the more you, time you spend there, the more you just start uncovering things. Mm -hmm. So, And plus, I have a deep love for that town. After Katrina, I mean... You know, knowing those places, I was watching on TV all the awful stuff. I mean, it just broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an it, it's an impossible city. It shouldn't be. It there. is an impossible <laughs> city. It's below sea level, right? I mean, it's right. it is an impossible city. Which is part of the beauty and splendor of it in its yeah. own way. It's like that. It actually exists and it's existed for so long. But getting back to something you just said, yes. as a writer and as a writer observing people, have you noticed over over the years a certain homogeneity? In culture in the United States or the southern United States, uh, can you still find that local flavor that you describe so well in Fever Tree? That was the word I was looking for. It was about southern Louisiana is more homogenized. Um, yes, you can, especially in Florida, because Florida is such an odd, odd part of the country, such an odd state. Most people who know Florida... And certainly travelers know the coast, both coasts, east and west. Uh, not a lot of travelers go inland, <clears throat> which is a shame because my favorite part of Florida is inland. And it's much more, I mean, people that live down there just use the term all the time, oh, that's old Florida. Hmm. Old southern rivers, uh, the Spanish moss hanging off the live oak trees. Mm -hmm. And the people in the small towns, uh, sometimes you'll be talking to a third or fourth generation Floridian, which you do not see nearly as much on the coast. When I lived in Sarasota, I rarely met anybody that yeah. was from Florida. Right. They were a lot of people from the Midwest, yeah. like myself. Um, but when you go inland in Florida um, or, or in um, Apalachicola, the eastern side of the Panhandle, you you still get that feel of old old Florida, mm -hmm. which is wonderful because I mean I know there's still places like that in the South, but like everywhere else in the world, they're becoming more rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I lived in Vermont for a decade, and there's you can still find pockets where there's, there's genuine Vermonters and woodchucks, but then there's the guy from Jersey with the second you know vacation home. Yes, you know, yes. On the same you, dirt road. Right. I, <clears throat> Uh, a few years ago, uh, Sue and I went to Yellowstone, and we were staying in um, Livingston, Montana, mm -hmm. and talking to some locals one night, and uh, they were kind of complaining about all the movie stars. Yeah. They were like, I mean, one of them said to me, well, that Peter Fonda's okay. He's a nice guy. But uh, then mentioned a few other people who I will not mention. <laughs> and it's just, it yeah. was not really probably those people it was just that they weren't native yeah. Montanans. Yeah, and Western Montana is just too pretty, and unfortunately, yes. there's a lot of folks that want to live there with money. <clears> and some of, yeah, yeah, and some of it was financial. Yeah. They were driving yeah. the prices up. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which we see all over the place. Exactly. All that Sun Valley and, and Ketchum in Idaho when I lived in oh, Idaho. Right. It's like the service people can't live there anymore. They're commuting right. 90 miles to work in the winter just to is serve that right? the, the swells who come into Sun Valley and Ketchum. So. Yes. It's, uh, too, it's too pretty. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's too, too pretty. pretty. Exactly. Um, you've uh, 
your main characters indulge in reverie a lot. They go back yes. in time. Some frequency, and Dieter, obviously the best example, but it happens pretty much to everybody. Is that something you're conscious of as you write and say, I need to go back because I, we need to have a touchstone back here when we're going back and what happened in Mexico with this character in order to bring yes. the reader back to the present? That yes, is a it, very it, conscious plot <clears throat> device. It, it was a very conscious plot device because that's, uh, to be honest with you, Jim, that's how my mind works. Mm. I, it just goes back and forth in time. And um, and I think that's true of a lot of people, and I wanted to sort of capture that. I was also, again, here's a movie influenced. I was influenced in that uh, by the movie Reservoir Dogs, oh. the Tarantino movie. I've seen that, that three as, times. It, yeah, as you know, it, jumps, it is not yeah. linear. Yeah. And um, Why do I have to be Mr. Pink? I don't want yes. to be Mr. Pink. <laughs> Exactly. So that was uh, a device that I was, I had decided to use before I even started the first chapter. Mm -hmm. So, you, uh, in Fever Tree, in Fever Tree, I want to say there's a sense that all small towns are watching you. Where does that come from? Is that a Flannery or a <laughs> I live near Gaston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, sort of. <laughs> I can, I, can, I can edit that out. Too. Sorry, Gaston. It's fine. I can edit that out. Don't no, worry about it. No, <laughs> because let me tell you, people that live at Gaston, we get a kick out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's it's right. your decision. Uh, I, I'm being facetious. Yeah. To some degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, small town gossip is just a, a fact of life. But also, I grew up in Terre Haute, which is one of those towns because of economic reasons. It, do, it doesn't grow. If you look at the population growth of, of most towns, I mean, look at Portland. Forest Grove, Cornelius. Yeah. Um, th there's a pretty steady climb in population because the world's population is going up. Yeah. Terre Haute has stayed about the same population for decades. How big is Terre Haute anyway? Uh, the last time I looked, it was just over 100,000. Okay. Small city. Uh, and when I was growing up, it was about 80, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, it always had the feel of a smaller town. And everybody just knows everybody's business or wants to know everybody's business. Um, so in a place like Terre Haute, I don't know where you grew up in Vermont. Was it in a big no, I actually town? grew up in Connecticut in a town oh, called Enfield, which Thompsonville was the old section where I lived with my grandparents and parents until they got their own house. And that was the old section of town. But it's like you described. It's, it's basically... The highway runs through it. It's a service town for the nicer communities around it, and it's right. always been at 50,000 people, more or less, for decades oh, okay. and decades. It doesn't seem to change its population, and nothing seems to change there. Or maybe another big box store shows up or another chain restaurant shows right. up. That's about it. When you lived there, did you feel like it was watching you to any degree? Um, and in Thompsonville section, yeah, when I was little and stuff, I okay. felt like everybody knew, oh, there's Jimmy, and it's like uh, you go into a local general store, and there's Gorleys, yes. and you know, yeah, everyone everyone knew everyone. Now. Well, yeah. and a lot of people have mixed feelings about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I did, do. Um, I um, am kind of an open book, to be honest with you, but there are are people I want to be, that I choose to be an open book with, which is friends. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've always had a conflicted feeling. I don't think that watched. constitutes an open book if you choose to be open to each other. <laughs> well, Just want to make sometimes. that. <laughs> sometimes I'm an open book. <laughs> sometimes it's closed. <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, yeah, that, yeah. that was it. And, and, and Crooked River is small enough that, uh, especially with somebody like Mr. Gold, that, yeah. A lot of people know what you're doing or want to know. Right. And there's only so And that's natural. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, that's, I mean it, an outsider comes and brings stimulation, right? And, and yeah. curiosity and so forth. And there's only so many breakfast diners to go to in Crooked Tree, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and look, and exactly. And look at social media. People mm -hmm. seem to want to know yeah. everything about everything. And people seem to want to give up everything about themselves that <laughs> they have available. Exactly. You know, which <laughs> still astonishes me after all these years, quite <laughs> frankly. Too. So I have to ask you a question in Flamingo Lane, and I'm not even sure how to ask this. I mm -hmm. mean, because you're the writer here, but there's an interesting, I guess I'll call this a plot device. Um, Dieter and the novel Fever Tree are referenced in Flamingo Lane. And typically the reader encounters recurring characters, but this is something different. I don't know how to describe it. And how does that, you think, 
were you conscious of how this might impact the reader's suspension of disbelief when you have the writer referencing a book that you may have read by that writer? You see where I'm going? With I, I see it's exactly all, where you're it's going. It's in there. I, I, I see exactly where you're going, and that was, a, a again... It's unusual. It is unusual. Um, there was an influence for it um, from both uh, two of my favorite writers, Philip Roth and uh, Paul Oster, mm-hmm. who... Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Oster's New York trilogy, but I, it, I am okay. At some point, I, I can't remember. It was the first book. Been a long time. At, yeah, at some point, Paul Oster, uh, in in the first book, uh, he's talking about these other characters, and it's it's of course third person narration. And then at some point in the first book, he says, and then Paul Oster woke early that morning. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that th- that was an influence, and of course, there's. Um, uh, the the whole idea of metafiction is something that's always fascinated me. Mm-hmm. But knowing that, I knew, and there are people who don't like it. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I've gotten letters, uh, emails um, from people who were fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not everyone's cup of tea. I have a very close friend who's a crime writer, and she. We're close enough that we're dead honest with each other, and um, she doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and and she was almost just embarrassed to say that it just didn't feel right to her. Mm-hmm. But I had no problem with the fact that that she does or th- that it bothers her somewhat. Mm-hmm. And um, and I said that's fine because you you know you uh, writers can learn from criticism more than they can learn from praise. Oh. I mean, Hemingway was made one of those infamous Hemingway right. statements, and he said, uh, just ignore the reviews, especially the good ones. Especially the good ones. Right. right. And um, so it is, a, it, metafiction is just not something for every, it's not everybody's cup of tea, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's something that kind of fascinates me because after all, it is fiction. Right. And it's, you? so it's it's fiction in the, Outside the book, and it's fiction mm-hmm. inside the book. The third book does not do right, this. That was going to be my follow-up question. Yeah, and, and again, I don't really have a dog in the sun. I don't, I'm not sure how I... Yeah. It didn't really affect the flow so much, but I could see how some reader would say, wow, I'm just no longer in the novel anymore because he just took me out of it. I didn't yes. feel that way. But that could... suspension of belief. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. It, okay. it wasn't a decision I made lightly mm-hmm. when I did it, but... Uh, so the, the new book, which has a title by now, I think. It's called The House on Britannia Street. Britannia Street. Um, now, when you're in the... And you say this one's almost complete. Almost yes. Ready for well, I, it's completed in a draft, which I hope is the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the last draft, but I've said that before. Do, do you... Uh, <laughs> and you talked about your crime writer friend. Do you actually share your work in progress and de- get that criticism? Do you seek that out by people you know and admire their work or their opinion about writing? Well, that's curious because um, when I was writing primarily poetry, I had a um, very close friend who actually published my first book of poetry and it was a very good poet named Eric Muller who sadly recently passed away. And I, I never sent a single poem in the last seven or eight years to a journal uh, without Eric looking at it. And mm-hmm. pretty much the same for him, though he was more prolific than I was, so there were some that he just knew that were okay. I was also very, very involved in a, in a, in a good poetry group. And these were seasoned poets. We all had a track record. Uh, we all did admire each other's work, but we had enough of a track record to have thick skins about things. Mm-hmm. And again... If you're going to join one of those groups, you're going to have to listen to things that you don't want to mm-hmm. necessarily hear, and that at some point, and it sometimes are absolutely true, and will help you write a better poem. Mm-hmm. But with fiction, not so much. I just, I had a um, fear that if I, I, I've been invited to join groups, writing groups that include novelists. My fear is. Um, that I would get torn in different directions. 
for instance, if I was in a group and three or four people said, I, I, I'm the metafiction angle, the, the book right. within the book is just kind of rubbing me wrong, I, I would be tempted to change it, and I don't want to do that. I'm right. glad I, I didn't. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, because I'm long-winded, yeah. uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I do show some chapters mm. to other writers right uh and some sections of chapters and there's sometimes i'm stuck on something and i'll send it to writers that i know can probably unstick me but overall not nearly as much as i did when i was writing primarily poetry mm -hmm. yeah yeah because we used to have uh, writers in the grove we used to meet in our right in this oh, room yes. every saturday for years and years pre-pandemic i'm not really sure they never really grew the group that much, but I always wondered about the dynamic. I always wanted to just drop in and just see just how do they go about sharing their ideas and does it really move the ball for them as far as in their own fiction? Because they yeah. may have all different writing styles and what there's, unless there's a very specific comment about, a general comment about writing, like you can't do this here because of this, but everything else where the rule, I mean, Yes, you may be breaking rules all the time because you're you're telling your vision and fiction and whatever right. it is your story and well the other uh, big factor in that though for me and a lot of other writers is I um, Amberjack Publishing which published the first two books and they're in, uh, Idaho, they're in Idaho by the way I they're down, they're, they're not anymore oh, they're, they're not they, they were they were actually bought out by the Chicago Review Press oh, okay. so uh, I know some of the staff were offered positions, but part of the stipulation was you yeah, live reload. in Chicago. Yeah. So my yeah, publisher, for instance, Dana Anderson, who's a wonderful, wonderful person, um, she actually was in Portland for a convention. She called me and we met, and she said I'm, and told me what was going on, that she was going to, she's with a different publishing firm now. But at any rate, what I was going to say is I had, um, for a, a relatively small publishing firm, I, I had two editors that were amazing. Mm. One was sort of overall, her name's Kayla Church, looked at things in an overall perspective, talked about the metafiction angle. And one, uh, John Good was uh, just is an extremely detailed person. For And she would say things like, uh, she emailed me one, I mean, we had thousands of emails, of course, going back and forth, hundreds. She emailed me one time and said that you're going to have to remove something on page whatever it was, 37. And I said, what is it? She said... You, you you say he's wearing bling. She said that word wasn't in the common uh -huh. vernacular at that time. I was Good like, catch. whoa. I said, when was it? She goes, 1991 or something. Uh -huh. The sub rapper was the first one to yeah. mention bling or whatever. But she was really detail-oriented. So... Um, like all good editors, they were bound and determined to improve the book, and they did books immensely. And I felt that their feedback was more valuable than a writing group mm -hmm. might have been. So, you mentioned something about the bling, the, the catching that in in the mm -hmm. novel where it didn't belong, and it's like it makes me think again about some uh, juxtaposition between truth and authenticity, mm -hmm. and. I wrote about that in some library literature stuff years ago okay. right? and people writing memoirs. But what's more important in fiction, authenticity or sticking to the truth about a place and what building is there? No, it's authenticity, isn't it? Yes. Making, making it feel authentic is more important. Yeah, and you know, I just read a book called Just Thieves by a writer named Galloway. And um, I had seen, I'm a fan of the um, crime writer and poet, James Salas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the uh, yep. series down in New Orleans. Yep. And... As you know, with Salas' <clears throat> books, there's lots of digressions that go. They go lots of different places. Um, and this writer was probably influenced by that. But one of the things I noticed is throughout the entire novel, he never said where they were. He did not mention a town. He did mm -hmm. not mention, he would say, a diner, not mm -hmm. a specific name. And it worked for that book. Right. It would be hard. I would, it would take me an hour to explain why I think it works for that book. Mm -hmm. A lot of books it wouldn't. And you're right, though, between office, authenticity and the truth. It's a fine line sometimes. And it brings up the whole, I've been asked before, why did you use a fictional town? But mm -hmm. there's other towns in it that aren't fictional, Tallahassee right. or Terre Haute or wherever. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. Well, then sometimes you're creating a composite, right? So it's not exactly. one town. You're taking elements of from your memory of places you've been and putting that, them together. For instance, Crooked River was based, as I said before, yeah. the waterfront was based, is based 
specifically on Apalachicola, which is still, as we speak, an industrial waterfront. I mean, to me, it's mm-hmm. just beautiful. And there's it's no a, town square. There's no town square. There's no town square. You know, where I got the town square was from Wise Blood, the Flannery O'Connor. Oh, okay. And from yeah. some of her short stories, I didn't okay. want to set it in Georgia because I needed it on the water. Mm-hmm. But that whole southern plaza, southern square, yep. which is still out there. I mean, go to Dallas, Oregon, for yeah. instance. It yeah. looks kind of like that. Yeah. Um, you can almost feel the sultry summer heat, you know, the moisture right. in the air. and <clears throat> Right. And, it, you know, the Gibson Hotel is there. and the, mm-hmm. Sure. So yeah. they are composites, just like your characters are. They're mm-hmm. composites. So we're hoping to see you've got a first draft of book three of the Southern Noir tw- Trilogy. We've been talking with Tim Applegate here today on Off the Shelf. So we hope to see that being published sometime in the near future. And then you think you might be working on something beyond that, another project, fiction. I mean, obviously, I you're am. writing poetry right along. Yes, um, not as much as I used to. But I mm-hmm. am actually, uh, I've put uh, the house on Britannia Street away um, for six months because of... Uh, very good California poet one time told me you should do that with your work put it mm-hmm. away. after you think you're done put yeah. it away for a few months if you can and then go back with the new eyes the only thing I'll, I'll six I'll months hurt. is a long time that's hard well there's a reason okay. so there's, yeah. uh, um, and I will say one thing it's not the first draft it's it's about the 20th but oh, I, I, okay. I hope it's the next okay. to last <laughs> um, but I feel like I need that uh, the time away from it to get perspective on it because you get so obsessed when you're writing a novel. I mean, you have to be obsessive to write a novel. And and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think you just, sure. it's just always inside you. Those characters become more real than the people you talk to sometimes, real, more real than real people. But I've had it in my mind to write a book uh, set in Terre Haute, where I grew up, because if there was ever oh, a town okay. that was ready made for a cry bevel, it's Terre Haute. <laughs> uh, so I started just writing some rough draft stuff of that. And then I'll there. go back to uh, the New Orleans and do it yeah. one more time yeah. and send it out. Okay. So. Well, again, we've been talking with Tim Applegate here, author of Fever Tree and Flamingo Lane, and hopefully the forthcoming The House on Britannia Street. Correct. Correct. To complete the Southern Noir trilogy. Um, Tim, it's been marvelous talking with, with you today about oh, your you. writing, um, and good luck with the next novel and your writing beyond it. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to the podcast. This was very enjoyable. Great. Thanks again, Tim. Thank you, everyone.